What's up, everyone? Welcome to the show. We are live right now on Cannabis. And if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a great show for you. Make sure to hit like and subscribe and strap in. We're going to be talking all about making your own rosin extracts at home and just talking you through how you can make your own extracts. So we've got an award-winning extract maker today with uh, Mush Mouth. So make sure to stay tuned. We've got a great one for you. But first, I need to get in to a few shout outs. First shout out is of course to the Cannabuzz community. I've got a bunch of people watching me live right now in the Cannabuzz app. They're chatting with us right now. And these chatters, the people that join us live in the chat, they're gonna be eligible to win a pack of seeds and a Grove bag at the end of the show. So if you wanna be part of that crew, go to Cannabuzz in the App Store, search Cannabuzz in the App Store, download our app, or just go to Cannabuzz.app in your browser. Join our monthly membership community. You can join for as little as about four bucks a month, and you can use the code GROWERSLOVE for 50% off your first month, and all that support helps us keep this show going. And it's also a great way to uh, join a little community and get access to our giveaways and all that fun stuff. So make sure to join us over there. Also, a big shout out to Grove Bags or Terp Lock, as they're also known. Terp Lock, go to grovebags.com, get yourself a bag. This is just a little example. I've got a quarter pound bag here as well, and they go all the way up to giant liners for like your storage containers. And what this bag does is it's got technology in it that can cure your weed to perfection. It's gonna, you don't have to worry about burping the bag or anything like that. You just dry your weed to uh, a good amount and then you just throw it in the bag and then you're good to go so make sure to check out if you're not familiar go to grovebags.com use the code cannabis for seven percent off also look up our interviews with the grove bags guys to learn all about the tech and uh, jr was using it and he was swearing by it so it was a pretty big endorsement by him and then lastly, shout out to our friend over at TikiMadman.com. Tiki Seeds, he's always cranking out great genetics, and he's always uh, hooking us up with the latest news. What's the latest from Tiki? Uh, Tiki's going to be having the summer sale, uh, which is a 20% off the entire site at TikiSeeds.com. And uh, also, uh, he's going to be... Uh, at the secret stash later at the end of this month. Uh, and I'm going to try to get down there as well. Uh, there's going to be, it's pretty much a breeder event. There's going to be a ton of really good breeders down there, a uh, good community, good vibes, and it should be a good time. So uh, check out secret stash. If you hit up Tiki's IG or even uh, Rasta Jess IG, uh, you'll see information about uh, secret stash. Both of them will be there. Awesome. Well, let's get into it. Our guest today is Mushmouth. He's a breeder and an Oregon, Oregon third generation cannabis farmer. Actually, right before we got into the show, we were just talking about digging deep holes to put your outdoor plants in. So we are super excited. He just recently uh, competed at Ego Clash, which is a yearly event in Northern California. And he is the owner of the Legends of Mush. Welcome to the show, Mushmouth. Hey, how's it going there? <laughs> Mushmouth, you are a man of many words, my friend. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, let's get into it. So uh, tell us about the new breeding project and uh, tell us about us, uh, you know, your process of selection a little bit. Well, the, uh, it's not that reason for being a project. It's something that uh, me and buddies have been testing for the past about three or four years now. It was a collab I did with Heroes of the Farm. Uh, we went through a thousand seeds of the Irish stout to find the male we were looking for because most Irish stout is short, squat, bushy plants. And typically your male pass on all your uh, branching and bud structure. So we were trying to find a male that was stand out more vigorous and still had a good smell to it and whatnot, which was hard to find, but we did find one that we chose to keep around. And it, uh, I like to let my males grow out without topping them because I want to see how nice they branch out. Uh, and this one did a lot like my time wreck mill did and just had a nice even level canopy without topping it kind of a situation. And I like seeing that in my plants because I just know that's going to pass on to most of the progeny by having that in your mill. You know what I mean? Mill selection is a real big part of a uh, good breeding. Um, without good mills, you're not going to have as good of vigor and as good of offspring. Uh, now, previously we um, had uh, Ross and Jeff on and, 
he had kind of philosophies for uh, the way males perform and the way you select. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, you know, your male, like I said, has a lot of your branch structure and your vigor added to it. I feel uh, females tend to dominate your terpene more so than your males do. But once again, some terpene strains are just more dominant than others. And even with branch structure, some strains are just more dominant on breeding out than others are. Um, so it's really uh, not everything always breeds out like you expect. But with a typical, you know, offspring, I've noticed that your male definitely does dominate branch structure more than your female does. Excellent. Interesting. That's interesting. That and, you know, obviously going off your stem rub smell and how your bud structure, because that's another structure that you can see, like, how tight are your male flowers? How clustered are they? Are they spread out and sparse? You know yeah. what I mean? Because it's going to pass on a lot of those similar structures to your female, you know, to your female progeny. Because you got to think if it's dominant branch structure, bud structure, stuff like that, you want to see how the fully developed flowers are and how it does its thing. Because not all males really shine like others, you know? And, okay. uh, on the stem rub, I have a kind of random question because it's just something that I've noticed recently because um, I, I just did like a little pheno hunt of some seeds that a friend sent. And, uh, you know, so I had like five and I was trying to pick between them. And I, I felt like the stem rub scent changed over time across the same strain. Is there like a good time to do the stem rub where it's like the most accurate, so to speak? Yeah. Um, obviously when they're more mature and more figured out, fresher seeds are still developing and they're still trying to, you know, decide what they're really showing and they aren't really put off what they're going to show yet. Uh, more so like early flower kind of stuff, more where you're going to get more your actual kind of smell that you're going to pass on. Um, another thing, the why I like to pop so many when I'm looking for males, I want to see what the females do, because if I can find males and females that look similar from the original stock, I can then predict kind of what that male is going to have similar characteristics to because the male and the female are showing already signs from that from the first parent stock. So that's another reason why it's good to fully grow out females and males before you truly do your breeding because you want to see what is already there in your original process that you're breeding out. Interesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, like structure wise and stuff. And so with your Irish stout, uh, uh, what are the terp profiles that are uh, you're expecting to get or what has kind of been shown? The Irish stouts, uh, Got a lot of gas to it. There's a lot of dog walker in there. I'm a big gas fan. Um, but there's a nice sweet cream finish that it adds to a lot of things. And everything that it, we've bred it with rosin-wise, rosin's at high rates and has a nice wet texture of the rosin, which is a really big thing in the rosin game when you're doing cold cure, is not everything cold cures out to a nice wet texture that everyone loves. If it comes out dry, it's just not as appealing. And so it, that's really string dependent. And that is one thing I did notice that Irish Stout passed off to most of its offspring. Excellent. Um, so uh, where are these seed packs available? And talk a little bit about the Oregon breeders uh, that are also uh, available. So, yeah, um, uh, my buddy is starting up a Saturn Seed Bank. Um, he's Gnostic Seeds. Uh, there's also going to be Legendary Seeds from Braveheart, uh, Chief Cornerstone, which is Andrew Puffin. There's Camo Farms. Uh, and then Old Growth Farms Phil also just recently joined the crew today. Um, from what I was told, and then we're getting Legends of Mush on there. So all these growers have been growing in, in the Oregon scene for 10 plus years, doing what they do and been collecting genetics and just working on stuff over time. So the big thing that Saturn Seed Bank is trying to do is to work with just OG Oregon breeders and not work with a bunch of the hype brand genetics and stuff like that and get back to the roots of where a lot of this stuff came from. Yeah, I think that's smart. I mean, I, you were just talking about how you like the gas. That's what people want, dude. I've been hearing that for like years from, I remember a few years ago, my neighbor was like, man, I miss the gas. And now I hear like, everyone's like, man, we got to find some gas in our stable because everyone went so heavy in the like cookies and desserts direction. And now people are like, I, I guess I feel like people's palates get played out or sorry, tired, or they just, they miss those effects maybe, or the taste. What do you think? 100%. So one thing I'm trying to get into, like this goes with the Irish Stout, is it pass on some good savoriness to it. And uh, we cross it with the Head Dog 7, which is commonly quoted to smell like a meat and cheese platter. So I'm trying to get into the savory. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because everyone's got gas, everyone's got fruit and candy, everyone's got all these different things. I'm trying to get more to the savory things giving kind of smell. You know, I can oh, notice the meat breath. 
and stuff yeah, like yeah. That. like the garlic fries i've been told that some people think it smells like actual good garlic fries you know it has the garlic to it it has some doughiness to it and it just has like almost a pepperiness from all the gassy strains to it and uh i think that's a, a field of terps that i don't think has been played with too much so i feel everyone's chasing that new terpene profile and how it changes yeah. and where it to and i think that's one i feel uh can get more explored into because i don't feel it's been overplayed yet what kind of effects come with that taste if you if you've noticed anything most uh savory things i've had tend to come from the gassy strains so they more have the gassier kind of highs more Dumb. that head cerebral kind of functioning but not like lethargic like an indica dominant fruit could be to some um but once again, it's, it depends on where it comes from. As I've also uh, smelled savory from some Thai genetics, you know what I mean? Where it actually had like a cooked, you know, Thai food smell to a kind of That's a situation. Cool. And it's where these terpenes been played through because most people breed for yield or breed for look or something like that. And more, more people are breeding toward terps. And once again, it's not something that people have bred towards yet. So it's going to be interesting to see if people start switching to that, seeing what can really be pulled out. Because I feel like everyone went through all the gas and they pulled out the different variances between the different chemicals like kerosene and methyl, methyl and all that other kind of different stuff. And then they went through the fruits and they got the berries and the cherries and the papayas and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like it's there and it's in different stuff. It just hasn't been pulled out and coaxed out enough because it hasn't been what's on the desire. Yeah, you know what I mean? man, you just, yeah, you like uh, earlier in the chat, James Cannabis was like, he's like, now I just want to smoke now. And then what you and you, when you were talking about those tastes, it just made me think of like, I don't know, hanging out on the, you you were both, we're all on the West Coast, I think, right? Uh, it just made me think about like hanging out with a beer, smoking one of these, smoke like an IPA and uh, and my like pot roast <laughs> strain or something like that. <laughs> That'd be like, <laughs> it'd be a good combo. Um, one last question before we get into Rob rosin um uh because we're going to be talking all about rosin and everything about that but before we get into that i had one last question that came to mind is um in the past and maybe it was actually with our interview with you i can't recall but jr and we've all talked about how we've noticed that there's this kind of like sandy texture that you noticed when you're when you were like kind of rubbing the trichomes on a on a flower or whatever that that sandiness kind of translates to extract quality or like the likeliness that it'll be a good um yeah, you, can or, a certain you can feel to it you mean if it's too gritty or too waxy feeling yeah you know, once again this all comes with playing with hash and extracts in the flower itself and seeing how it comes out and some stuff i've had on the plant be super greasy but then the hash is super stable so yeah it's an indicator but it's not always a precise indicator you know what I mean? but it's like one of those feel feel signs that you can kind of just you know play with and have you, you know, noticed? It, yeah, I was going to ask, have you noticed any other characteristics that kind of seem to be associated with it? Or is that just like a, kind of a, a standout thing that you only get to discover at kind of the very end? Yeah, I mean, like I said, uh, some strains are super greasy, so they puddle up and they feel greasier while you're harvesting them. But those same strains are a little more sensitive. They don't have as thick of a wax membrane around their head. So I feel like they just grease together easier. So that feels like a hash of your plant. So I've had some strains not quite feel as like greasy or sticky, but then they hash great just because they have just a little bit thicker of a wax membrane, but it was just easier to collect because those thinner wax membrane heads are harder to collect. And if you don't freeze them fast enough, they become, you know, stuck together, which just makes them not allowed to pass through the right micron size bags. Interesting. So, well, let's so, de um, dive into rosin then. Let's get, let's get uh, all into the rosin. Um, just conversation. So first off, can you explain to us what is rosin? What is cannabis rosin? Rosin is a heat and pressure extract, um, depending on if you're doing flower rosin or hash rosin. Um, it's all done very similar with heat and pressure at a bag to filter out what you're trying to get out of it kind of a situation because you're not using a solvent. So you're relying on a mechanical separation whether you're being hashing, making keef, however you're doing your solventless hash or non-solvent hash, however you want to classify that. Um, it's uh, all about either micron size or separating things, you know, just due to size of your microns in your hash, just like with pressing on your rosin. Uh, you want to use a filter so you just get your juices out from inside your heads, essentially. 
so you aren't getting any of that plant matter to come through or any of that stuff that will leave char on your nail and that kind of situation. And so uh, just before we get totally into it, can you talk a little bit about the different in gland, uh, gland head sizes, like with sometimes with outdoor versus indoor and the difference of outdoor rosin uh, or sun-grown rosin versus indoor rosin? Yeah, um, sun-grown, in my experience, always has bigger heads, so you'll catch more in your higher micron size bags. And uh, since you're dealing with the sun, you're not dealing with such a high heat intensity right on top of the plant. So the plant's not going to freak out and create such a thick wax membrane around your uh, head. So you're going to get an overall better pass to rosin yield because your plant's not fighting off the intensity. So when we, we do a hash and rosin off of indoor plants, uh, the HPS lights always have the lower yields with the thickest wax membrane heads because the light is so hot and intense right above it kind of a situation. And I feel it's the plant trying to sunscreen itself essentially from how intense the light is right next to it. Not necessarily a PPFD situation, but like the heat intensity and everything else that goes into what the plants absorb, how that plant's absorbing the light. And so now you've been uh, experimenting uh, with the LED lights. Have you done a run of hash since you've been uh, using the STEC uh, LED lights? Uh, yeah, our first round, we uh, swapped out at week three from our uh, ceramic metal halide lights, which I was a great fan of for hash, makes great hash. But uh, STEC reached out to us, gave us a sponsorship, so we swapped out uh, for their lights. Uh, the first round we uh, actually placed with our lava cake at Sea Hill, fifth place, um, was the first round under the STECs. Um, I would definitely say the yields are comparable to what I would see off my CMHs. Um, and even better rosin yields on sun strains than I got off my ceramic metal halides. But that's strain dependent. Some strains were the same, whether it had been HPS, CMH, or metal halide, or uh, LEDs. But we had a few strains that overall did way better numbers of rosin and hash yields under the LEDs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hear a lot of people are saying that now that they're getting into a uh, full spectrum LED and a, a higher intensity LED, as far as getting down into the canopy and stuff like that. So um, talk a little bit about how heat and pressure uh, affects and uh, exudes the residuous goodness as uh, opposed to the way maybe a solvent would. So a solvent, it's chemically breaking it down and separating it, and then you're filtering it out and then purging off the solvent. So you're literally dissolving everything, getting every last little trichome, every last little cannabinoid you could potentially get off of the plant. But you're also pulling all the waxes and all the other stuff. And then you got to go through other filterization process to get rid of those waxes. You didn't want them in the first place. Whereas with hash, we're so gentle with it. We're just getting the heads and maybe some of the stalks. So uh, by doing that, we're getting a cleaner, natural product without having to use harsh chemicals in a situation. I'm never going to be worried that I'm going to blow myself up or anything like that. You know what I mean? Um, I've never personally made BHO. I've never made water hash, but I've been making water hash since I was 14. That's what my dad taught me. So it's like I, I was already doing this before BHO blew up. So I never saw the need to do it kind of a situation. And now BHO is just so overrun with garbage. No one really even wants it. So everyone just switched to rosin. So now there's a lot of rosin on the market, but it's good because it's a lot better for people to smoke, in my opinion. That's the main reason why I like hash and rosin is the smoothest smoke on my lungs. I'm asthmatic. If I smoke like flour or salt grown flour and BHO, it's just harsh on my lungs. You know what I mean? So I'm a big believer that hash and rosin is probably the healthiest way to uh, smoke cannabis. You and and on mean? the topic of BHO, like safety, um, there was not that long ago, this is like a handful of months ago, a house in San Francisco that blew up where a guy was making BHO and he blew up his house and killed his neighbor. It's crazy. It just happened just recently. I thought that was like just old stories that I heard, but this just happened recently. It's craziness. Yeah, it happens. I mean, even in proper labs, if you don't have the proper stuff set up, there are potentials for it to happen. If there's a leak in the system, is it improper welds or some other little... I've heard of some crazy horror stories. You never hear about that with hash. I mean, worst case, you hear about, oh, all the hash water spilt on the ground and I lost my batch. You know what I mean? No one lost life. No one, no one got burnt. None of that kind of silly nonsense. 
So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, glad that a lot of people are switching over to rosin and just the better health benefits that it has in comparison. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's really good. I think that uh, it is very dangerous because everything's under pressure, you know, with rosin, the only pressure you have is what you're squishing. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. pressure in tanks. It's nothing that's going to blow up. It's just heat and pressure. Uh, so uh, can you explain the main differences for the folks uh, between flower rosin and hash rosin and what your uh, advantages of one over the other or one and what the advantages of maybe the other are? Um, I mean, the biggest advantage of the flower rosin is you don't need as much product to make an extract. So that's the biggest thing. If you're a smaller producer or you're just doing for your home and you don't have that much, flower rosin makes sense because you can take just your flower and press it. I personally don't feel flower rosin ever tastes that great. I feel like it always has a typical like a burnt popcorn vaporized taste because you're essentially kind of almost vaporizing the weed while you're pressing it. So some of those that little vaporization of the flour actually comes into the rosin flavor. Um, that's why I'm a big fan of more of the half rosin because you're able to separate all that plant matter before you press it. So you're not getting any of those vapors to transfer into the rosin. But like I said, you would need more product and more space to wash the hash, dry the hash and all that other kind of stuff. So that's the biggest pro in my opinion to flour rosin versus half rosin. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Well, so we we just recently had um, Johnny Casali from Huckleberry Hill Farms on the show and his uh, White Thorn Rose extracts. They've been winning awards at the Emerald Cup. And we were talking about uh, with him about the timing of when they chop his plants because he works with, um, you know, some folks that are experts. And, and, and we were trying to kind of figure out when do you chop your plants down to have the best terps and the best extracts and all that kind of stuff so can you talk to us about that yeah definitely so a lot of the time you know we harvest since we're harvesting fresh frozen we're capturing those terps exactly how they are when we harvest it so by doing that if we're looking to you know uh get our strain more fruity like our lava cake if we take it past day 60 ish she kind of gets kind of a funky Tennessee ball kind of smell to it compared to if we take it like right at 56, 58 days, it's like a super great candy. You know what I mean? So just a couple of day change, you can change the terps a lot when you're talking about an extract kind of a situation, because that's what you're going for a lot of the time when you're, when you're doing hash and extracts is everyone really likes the terps. Everyone's looking for what's the best flavor, what's the best variant get out of this and whatnot like that, because your THC window of being right is a good, five, six days where you're going to be your most right THC. Your terps can change a lot in that five, six day window. And depending on what kind of trip you're trying to pull out of the plant, it can change a lot. Some strains wow. will stay the same in that week. Some strains will change in two days. Wow. That's so crazy. So can you like, um, so what am I looking for? You know, like I've got one of those somewhere on my desk, somewhere my desk is a mess. <laughs> I've got a microscope that I hook up to my phone, you know, and I look at the trichomes or whatever, like, what am I, what am I looking for? What am I smelling for? You know, when I know I'm in that like right day or whatever. The cloudy trichomes is your biggest sign of having your, you know, biggest amount of THC. If your trichomes are too clear, your THC is not fully active. So, you know, that'll give you a lighter colored rosin, but a lower yield because your trichome heads themselves expand as they get more ripe. So it, by harvesting earlier, you're, har you're hurting yourself on yields and overall terpenes and overall effect. So you really want to look for when you think your plant looks done as far as pushing buds and as you know, you're looking for that cloudy trichome, but then within that window of when those, you know, most of your trichomes are cloudy before they really get to Amber, when is your favorite terpene expression of that plant? Okay. You know, some people like it on the early side. Some people like it on the later side because everyone has just a different terpene palette. You know what I mean? Everyone is looking for something different. So yeah. if you didn't, you know, kind of situation like that. So you're saying at that point, it's just me basically going up to the flowers, sn smelling it. And you're saying you can, re there's a noticeable difference day to day when you're, once you're doing that. Yeah, definitely on, on some strains, not all strains. Like I've had some strains smell the same for like three weeks. I've had some strains change in a matter of a couple of days. So if you're really trying to just harvest for your proper, your favorite terpene expression that you can get out of the plant, that couple day change, it can be a lot. Wow, that's so cool. Well, thank you so much for talking me through that. That's so, that was super useful.
Yeah, really useful. Um, I think that um, one of the things about rosin that is so appealing is is its flavor and taste. And I think, you know, for me, it was kind of, I didn't even realize that that was a thing, that you would time it based on the terpene profiles in a window of doneness uh, versus the old, you know, 10%, 20% amber, good to go kind of thing. Uh, so let's go ahead and start getting into uh, rosin making. Um, so just for your home person at home, uh, what are some of the specs needed uh, for them to get a good press and get a decent product out of what they're pressing? You know, you honestly, I'd never really go over uh, 2,000 PSI, or, you know, pounds per square inch uh, on my press. So I'm never pressing over two tons, and that's spread across my uh, four by seven inch plate. So it's really, you don't necessarily need tons of tons of pressure to get everything out. It's more so, you, you you know, a little bit of extra time in that heat to work everything out. You know what I mean? And proper uh, temperatures is one of the biggest things when it comes to rosin. If you're pressing too hot, it's not going to come out great. You're pressing too cold, you're not going to get the greatest yields. And every strain is different. Not every strain likes the exact same temperatures. Some strains like it a little warmer. Some strains like it a little colder. Um, usually when I judge that uh, on hash, at least, it's on the melt quality. The higher the melt quality, the lower temperatures I like to press it. If it's something that's not the meltiest, I'll press it a little higher of a temperature to help get everything out. So what kind of heat ranges are you in and how? what is your duration of the press? Um, duration of the press depends on how big of a patty I'm pressing. I usually just press until it stops oozing, which I'm usually pressing 30 to 60 grams at a time. So that's usually five to 10 minutes, depending on the temperature. Uh, a lot of the stuff I press at 150, so it takes a while just for it to come out. But you got to go low and slow. And as long as you don't have green contaminants in the house, you're not going to get a green taste in your rosin. Um, some people swear by getting the rosin off as fast as you can and pressing a little hotter and just squeezing real fast. I feel, you know, low and slow is better, but everyone does their preference, you know, and it just takes dialing in for what you like. And like I said, some strains are different. Some strains just like it a little warmer. But my main window that I go from is 150 to about 175 on those less meltier strains um, for flower rosin. I feel like it's more of like a 160 to like a 190. Um, and once again, flower rosin, you want it to be a little bit more on the human side. You don't want super dry flowers or it's not going to have the best yield. You need a little bit of moisture to help get that rosin to juice out of there. So do you have any idea of moisture meter wise where you're at? Nine, hmm. eight, six? I would say for best results with rosin, you probably want a 12 to 18% moisture content. Most flowers, okay. Oregon has to test under 10% moisture content. So most flower you're going to go buy under dispensary is going to be drier than what you want for pressing. Okay. See, that's, that's good information for people to know. Uh, those are the little tips and tricks that we love uh, for you folks to share. Uh, yeah. So now with when it comes to bags, I know we mentioned this before, but go ahead and talk a little bit about the bubble bags themselves and uh, quality of the bag you need to get a good product that you can press. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different good uh, brands of bags out there. Um, I haven't necessarily had uh, – there's obviously the cheaper brands are lower quality, and they may flake apart. You may get contaminant because they're just made out of a lower quality product, so don't get too cheap of bags. But there are some decent brand bags out there that are decent prices that aren't super cheap but aren't like break the bank. Like uh, who was that? Rosin Evolution, I think, has decently good cheap bags, uh, which I, I use those for like my work bags that I wash in my big trash can. I'll use the good bags that are a little on the cheaper side but not super expensive because that's what's going to get beat up the most with the whisk that we hand wash with. Um, and then the bags that I collect with, I go all out and I get the best brand of bags which is the ice extract equipment, in my opinion, because they have like a bonded mesh bag. Most people don't have a bonded mesh bag. They are pricier. They're definitely like two to four times the price of most bags. But that's what I used to collect the hatch. That's where I feel like you want the quality. And that's why I just do the little bit cheaper of the bags for work bags. Once again, it's going to get beat up. It's going to get worn out. You're going to replace it more than you're going to replace your hash bags that you collect with if you treat your bags properly. 
You know what I mean? Is you want to take care of your bags. You want to let them dry out. You want to clean them when they get dirty and stuff like that. So um, since I'm a kind of a noob in this whole area, um, can you also give me, a, either of you guys, JR or Mushmouth, can you guys give me an idea of like, what should I budget for this project? You know what I mean? Because we're going to be talking about a washer, which I've seen people use these like kind of, they're like almost like washing machine type things that you can plug in. And those look really, those look interesting. Um, and then you, so you have that and then you have the bags like you've just been talking about. And then there's the press. Like if I'm just a home maker, I've got my own, maybe I've got a three by three tent or I've got an outdoor grow and I'm just pressing my stuff for myself. What do you guys think I should ballpark budget? Um, I mean, if you're trying to do it proper, probably at least a thousand dollars is a decently cheap set of bags is going to cost you a couple hundred. Um, I'm a big fan of hand washing, which helps cut costs on. You don't need the washing machine and the other kind of stuff that goes with that. Um, and then just a freezer, one of the biggest things is keeping everything cold and proper to make sure it stays frozen and fast. Is that like if you're dealing with fresh frozen, if you're not freezing it fast enough, it's going to taste green. It's going to not be you know, super quality. It's like very sensitive when you're dealing with a fresh frozen material. Um, dry material is a lot less sensitive, but you still want to get it into the freezer as soon as you're done trimming it or as soon as it's dry to your, you know, dryness that you're looking for. Okay, Mushmouth, I had a hack that I did when I was making my bubble. Uh, what I would, and you can tell me if this is good or not, I would get like a Coleman cooler, a nice big Coleman cooler, uh, then I would put my ice in there, and I'd put, like, just a couple chunks of dry ice at the top, close the lid, and get it really super, super dry and cold. Then I would remove the little chunks of uh, dry ice at the top, and then I would add my uh, material in, and then just straight tap cold water. I would lightly, I would mix in the cooler, and then drain everything from the cooler into the bag. Um, that was kind of my process. Uh, is that good, bad, or where where am I at there? The ice might be a little too cold. Is if you're starting to freeze up your water and freeze up your buds, it's the hard for the trikes to fall off. Because I've had some super cold buds out of the just freezer sometimes that if I don't let them soak for a good 20 minutes, they're just solid rocks that nothing's going to come off of them. So you don't want to go too cold. But once again, if you don't have a cold room, you know, starting off a little cold is not a bad idea. So there's a lot of variables when it comes to that. So if you're not working with a cold room, it's going to make working fresh frozen almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Kind of a situation where if, if you're just doing it at home, dry is just a lot easier of a hash to work with. It's not going to come out as terpy. It's not going to come out as light of a color as fresh frozen would. But it's going to be a lot more forgiving in the end. It's going to be a lot harder to mess it up and make it taste bad. That makes sense. Can you talk us through, um, so on the, pr go going back to the pressing sty, so we just switched from washing to back to pressing. Um, can you talk about the bags that you're putting the weed in to, but to you press? Cause I've seen, I've had friends that have done it on parchment paper or whatever. And then I've seen these like mesh puck type things like, yeah, what's the situation What and why is one better than the other? Well, like you can press flower rosin without those bags. You're just going to have green contaminant in your flower rosin. You know what I mean? So the bag just helps you keep that plant matter within a certain confined area while you just get the rosin out of it. Um, so you got to use parchment on either side. So with a hash, you, it, the hash, use a 25 micron usually is the most common. They go down to 15 micron bags. Uh, uh, I've seen some people use some people like 37 micron bags for hash. But with hash, you want to double bag it before you press it, all that kind of good stuff. With flower rosin, you're gonna want like a 70 micron to 160 micron to press in because you're not trying to keep the smaller particles out. And so talk about the bags a little bit. I know like some of them can be complicated in, in the way that you have to fold them and stuff. Uh, is there a product out there that's kind of simplified all that? Um, I know they have the pre-pack situations where they pack the flour so it fits right into the bags. A lot of the companies that have the press bags have a pre-presser so it just slides right in there nicely. Um, and then you just got to fold your bags to where they don't come undone. A lot of the bags are sewed together so it just has the one end that's open. So I yeah. just it like a snail and then put it under there so that my press presses down on it, my press holds it closed. Okay. 
And so for parchment paper, um, can you talk about like maybe bleached versus unbleached and the quality of parchment paper you use? Uh, Most to, to squid. That I've used isn't very good quality. It falls apart in the press because how much the pressure is. Um, so I, I haven't had the best results on bleached parchment paper, the few brands I've tried. Uh, but the, you know, a thicker, decent parchment paper is going to hold together better. You got to think you're pressing that thing with one to two tons, sometimes more of pressure. And if the uh, parchment itself isn't going to, you know, it's going to wear out a little bit. So you don't want to use too cheap and too thin of a parchment paper where you're going to just end up with flakes of parchment in your rosin. Okay. So these, these companies that are selling parchment for the rosin industry and for rosin making, um, are they really anything special or can you just... They're definitely get... thicker than most brands that you'll go and find. I think Costco brand is one of the thickers I found in a store. But when it comes to like low temp and several of the other people that have their own parchments, they definitely have a nicer, thicker parchment. It just okay. costs, but it is nicer. Okay. So um, we had a question come in from our live chat. So once again, shout out to our members only community over at Cannabuzz and our members that support us every month and get access to our live streams. But uh, White Socks, he asked, um, Mushmouth, why do you prefer hand washing versus using one of those like five gallon washing machines like I was talking about earlier? Well, some strains, you got to really get into the buds to get them to open up so you can get all the trichomes off. Some strains like Gorilla Glue fall apart just by barely touching it. So those strains that are just fall apart in a washing machine get too beat up, and then you just get too much green plant matter in your hash, in my experience. So the fact that with hand washing, I can get as intense into that bud as I feel I need and then back off just to get the heads off that you cannot replicate in any washing machine I've seen. I would agree with that 100%. And that's the difference between, I feel like, artisan hash and uh, machine-made hash. So let's go ahead and start uh, shifting back uh, to the actual uh, washing part of it. Um, what is the best way to get your cannabis ready to harvest, to get it off the plant and into the freezer and uh, have it prepped uh, for uh, being uh, made into bubble. If you're doing fresh frozen and colder temperatures, you could work in the better. We uh, harvest parts of the plant at a time. We strive for uh, 30 minutes or less from off the plant into in the freezer. Um, we work in our cold room. Not everyone has a cold room. When I didn't have a cold room, I would har start harvesting at like midnight and then work until 6 a.m. to get the best temperatures I could outside or whatever you can but this is really temperature sensitive whether you're washing or you're pressing it's a big thing colder temperatures are, are better for harvest and freezing everything so it's going to make everything freeze faster if you can work in a colder environment everything's going to stay fresher it's going to just you know preserve your terpenes the best you can so we just harvest you know parts of the plant at a time and we work it's just me and one other dude uh, who work in a crew so i'm defanning it and then he's buffing it into these little totes that we have they hold about 300 grams of fresh plant matter. Those go straight into the freezer, no lid on it so that it can freeze and harden up. You put the lid on it, it's going to take a little while for it to freeze properly. Um, another good method is like cookie sheets. Chop your buds down on a cookie sheets, put those into the freezer. Uh, just like your uh, flash freezing blueberries or something like that. You want thin layers. You don't want to stack it too heavy because the thicker and more mashed together it is, the more chlorophyll that it's going to come out and the longer it's going to take to freeze. So you got to think when you mash up a bunch of plant matter together, the bigger, thicker it is, the more green it smells, the faster it decomposes because it's just gassing off in there. You know what I mean? And so when you're bucking your families, obviously that's every leaf with a stem. But then around the bud, you have leaf structures that come out that might have trichomes that come out a half inch or so. Are you nipping the green off of those, leaving the trichomes, or are those coming off as well? That's a great question. I personally don't believe in cutting leaves when I'm doing fresh frozen at all. If I can't cut it by a stem, I don't cut it. So it's either good enough to stay in there because it has enough trichomes or it doesn't have enough trichomes and I can get it by the stem and it's out of there. I try to get as much stem out as I can so you got to think about the cecitola pears that are on the stems. Those are going to come off in the wash, and there's going to be more contaminant and more green flavor potential in your hatch. 
So the cleaner you can get your fresh frozen with no stem, or even your dried trim or your dried bud, the less stem you can have in there, the better your hash is going to taste. And do you ever, uh, in those circumstances, or even when you're like uh, defoliating, uh, do you ever have a process that you use for your families that you uh, collect? Um, they just usually go out in the pile for compost or I feed them to my cows or my fan leaves. Yeah. Um, I like to take leaves all the way down to the main stem. I don't like to leave any little bit because no. that's just more when you go to harvest where that's going to yeah. end up. So I'm a big fan of taking fan leaves all the way to the base of them so yeah. there's less chance for stem to be in anything. We Excellent. also last D fan at about day 35 because that's when your most bud stack happens and when your most trichomes are produced is after that so we like yes. to get in and not get in there and pump buds after that because you gotta think you're dealing with uh mechanically separating the trichomes you don't have a solvent to break everything down that got stuck together in the process of growing so the gentler you can be on the buds throughout the whole time the more intact heads you're going to have left for you to actually extract. Because some people who are like, oh, I can't get good yields, but then they're all over their buds and squishing their buds all the time. It's like, yeah, you, you destroy your trichomes, you're not going to get anything off. Right. Kind of you would want to be super gentle in the last five weeks of flower when the trichomes are producing. And now if you are, say, a home user and you're uh, just, you want to have your flower at the best smoke, and what you have is dry trim uh, that you've done. Uh, what What's the best uh, methods for using that dry trim to make a uh, bubble uh, from that point? Um, first thing would be uh, get it trimmed when it's ready so that you can have your trim be as fresh as possible and get that trim in the freezer and store it till you're going to wash it. The fresher you can have it, the better it's going to come out. When it comes to that, as far as color, terpene loss and all that other kind of stuff. So instead of waiting to trim your stuff, just get it all done, get it backed up so you can get to hashing it. Um, another big thing with dry materials is you want to soak it for 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on how dry it is, because that's going to help your buds hold together in the wash. If you weren't to do, if you didn't let it soak, it would break down and you're going to get a lot more plant matter to come through into your hash. So you want the buds to fully hydrate in the ice cold water uh, before you start doing your mixing process. 100%. And so with your mixing paddle, are you using wood, metal, or plastic? I use a giant whisk. You use what now? A giant whisk. Like for a culinary whisk. Yeah. Uh, they have them on low temp for, I think, $100 or 70 ish dollars. 70 to $100, I forget. Um, but yeah, it's got like a four foot handle. And the head of the whisk is massive, but it's the most gentle hand washing while being thorough that I've found. Paddles are good, but they don't move the material like a whisk will. Interesting. I wonder if you could go to like a, a restaurant supply store or something like that and find like a giant whisk. I've checked out other places online for the same whisk and they're usually the same price or more. And I'm always ordering off a of low temp for my bras and press bags and other stuff. That's the brand of press I have is low temp. So I'm already going there. They have great customer service, all that kind of stuff. So I usually just get it from there because like I said, I checked out other places. They usually had more shipping and it usually costs more. Surprisingly, it's usually stuff gets greenwashed and they charge more for it when you're talking about cannabis. Right. Fair enough. I mean, Thanks. yeah. Thanks for the tip. Does low temp offer a home press type unit? Um, they, the smallest press they have, I think is a uh, three by five or three by six. They have just the cage kit, which you can get a press to press on. I think the cage kit, uh, is like five to 700. And then a press is, I think three to 500 from like Harbor Freight. Um, it's not the cheapest way to go about it. There's a lot of other brands that have smaller presses. I haven't personally used any other brands, so I don't, can't necessarily claim on how quality they are or anything like that, but they would all come down to the components they put into it. Do they put a good press in? Do they put in good coils? Do they put in a good heat system? All that other kind of stuff. I've had seen a lot of other people try cheaper brands, and then they just go out in a matter of a year, year and a half, and then I've seen people use low temp and then have the same system for six years, and it's just like, what's the point of buying something half the price to just replace it twice as fast? You know, that's, how I feel about, that's how I feel about my Blue, uh, Blue Lab pH bin. 
Totally. We, we I just had a question come in. Another question about the whisk, <laughs> um, and the and the and the act of kind of agitating everything. Um, so big bad badger said, "What about plaster whisks in a drill?" Um, so maybe you could just talk, speak to like how much am I like beating my shit up there? Like how? Yeah. <laughs> With the drills too much, what I like a drill's never gonna imitate by hand. You know what I mean? It's just gonna spin in a straight circle. I'm not sitting there spinning it in a straight circle. I'm moving it in all kinds of different directions, trying to get the buds open. So as I'm doing these different motions of just getting little vortexes to go and just moving the plant mat around, I pick up buds. I look at how they're looking. I look if they're opening up, if they're doing what I'm wanting. As soon as they start opening up and falling apart, I'm super gentle on that. I'm barely touching it. I'm barely moving it around because the biggest thing that you're going for, for the hard agitation is to get the buds as open as you want them. After that, it doesn't take much agitation to break off trichome heads. Cool. Great. Thanks for the clarification there. So as a home grower, uh, what's going to be uh, the best way uh, for them to kind of dry uh, and cure their, um, bubble uh, prior to squishing if they don't have a freeze dryer or something like that um, air dried um is what we've done for a long time there's still a lot of people who swear by air dried over freeze dried um air dried is where you either micro plant it or you sieve it so they're both different techniques depending on which one you're going for you're going to want a different wetness of your hash patty and you're going to want to freeze it and process it out of the bag differently um and once again these are sensitive to your temperatures. So if you're doing fresh frozen, if you're not in a cold enough of a room, air drying is super hard and almost impossible. So that's where one of the bigger things about having a cold environment really helps. Uh, sieving is going to be a lot easier than microplaning as far as temperature swings and being able to do it in a little bit warmer of a temperature. Um, but once again, dried material is going to help both of those situations out a lot. Just your hash is going to be less sensitive to the temperature fluctuations. It's not going to grease up as fast. It's going to go through your sieve a little easier. So with the sieve, you want to get it chunked up and you push it with a metal spoon through like a flour sieve essentially and get it to break out in these nice little particles. You let that dry on some parchment for a few hours, come back, push it through the sieve again to get it to break up even finer. And then you can let it sit for anywhere from a day to three days, depending on how dry your room is. And once again, if it's taking too long to get it dry, you might have mold start in your hash and stuff like that. If it's too warm, your hash is going to grease up. It's going to wax out and it's not going to stay clear. Air drying is really an art form. It is, it's hard to get done properly. You know what I mean? But once again, if it's just your own personal smoke, you aren't looking for the most pristine hash, obviously. You know what I mean? But if that's what you're going for, you can work at it and you can see what's happening and you can just practice and try for a better product because that's where we all started from. We all started from air dried and trial and error and messing stuff up and having this happen or having that happen. And the biggest thing when it comes to air drying is your temperature and your humidity of your room. If you're too hot or too humid, you're going to have issues. Now, back in the day, we would dry on pizza boxes. Uh, can you talk about that tech as as old tech as to maybe what we're doing now? Um, that's a decent way to do some air dried to help get a drier environment is to get brand new clean pizza boxes never been used. Line the bottom of that with parchment. Do your sieve or your microplane tech in that because then you can label your box. Less stuff's going to fall into there. And since your cardboard is super dry, it's going to make the inside of the pizza box drier than the room. So you're essentially going to be able to get a little bit drier of an environment than you would if you had just an open uh, cookie sheet with parchment on it, like some people do with the baking rack. You know what I mean? So that does help get you a better window to work with humidity wise if you didn't have the proper utensils to get your room where you want it. Nice. Good, good, good. So I have a yeah, couple I... questions. Sorry, JR. <laughs> I had a couple of real no, questions. Ahead. So on the cardboard, I've always wondered, do you run a risk of like the taste of the cardboard somehow transferring, is like transferring? You line it with parchment. If you're putting it straight on the cardboard, I could see that transferring. You're going to get some of that in there. But if you're lining your cardboard with parchment, yeah, you shouldn't have a part, you know, cardboard falling in there. Yeah, yeah, totally. Saying. And then on the refrigerator or freezer thing, I also had a question because I have a an old refrigerator and it came to mind. Do you ever have issues where that like freon taste smell transfers to the weed? Like I, I guess what I'm advocating for is like 
get make sure that your refrigerator or freezer is is like still doing good so that you don't like fuck up your shit basically i i personally have not experienced that yeah ever trans over ever have that issue but i haven't really had a freezer smell like freon i feel yeah. like if you're having a freezer or fridge have that smell the fridge itself just needs replaced yeah totally <laughs> yeah and so what about those fridge uh freezers in your refrigerator that have those constant defrost cycles uh does that affect uh the hash itself and maybe uh the moisture and buildup of condensation um, I mean, I haven't really had a freezer that's, that does that, has the defrost cycles. Uh, obviously, you want to run your stuff before you have defrost cycles. You don't want your stuff defrosting at all. You want it to stay frozen. I would say try to avoid freezers that have that if you're trying to use the freezer just for hash. Or if you have a freezer like that, wash it before it has a bunch of defrost cycles because that's going to degrade your flavor and all kinds of other stuff. I'm not sure how defrosted those things go. I haven't really worked with one. Um, I know from harvest to when we wash, we try to be a week or less. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but uh, the fresher you can wash it, the better it's going to come out. Yeah. So it would be advantageous to get maybe a small chest freezer. They're not horribly expensive. Well, that's what we rock. We rocked a bunch of just small chest freezers, and then we found these totes at Fred Meyer's. Uh, these are just clear food grade totes that just fit perfectly in there. So we just filled those up. They only hold about two, 300 grams of, fre of fresh biomass. So we're never putting too much at once, but let me just throw that in there. So it just constantly is, you know, putting, you know, keeping it fresh. Cool. Yeah, that's kind of where it, that's really helpful because that like, uh, you know, I think, you know, my immediate impulse is like, what's the freezer that I have or whatever. And it's like, you know, shoving some weed in between the pizza boxes and like the frozen Indian food or whatever. And like, no, maybe I should actually if I really want to commit to this hobby, I should invest in like a nice uh, freezer that I can put in my basement or garage or whatever the situation is so that I have that kind of dedicated space and like environment essentially. They have small ones. Like we even have a real small one. It was only, I think it was less than a hundred dollars and it holds a good few pounds of fresh frozen biomass. Wow. So if you're trying to do a small freezer, I think we got it at Bimart. They're super reasonably priced and you know, it just ensures the fact that you're not going to have a thaw on your product and ruin the product that you spent so much time and effort to get to where you want. Cool. So can you talk a little bit about your cold room and maybe uh, the cool bot as being a hack for people? Uh, cool bots are great. Uh, they you got to have a AC that's compatible with it or it won't work quite proper. But with the cool bot, you're able to get your room colder than you would with just a regular AC because it tricks it to thinking the room's warmer than it is. It just has a little heater that you wrap in with the temperature sensor. So it just tells it that, hey, it's actually 75 in here, not 60 like you're programmed to think and just keeps tricking it to keep running to get it colder. Uh, big thing with that, though, is you need the insulation. You want four inches of foam insulation minimum kind of a situation to get it to work properly. And then you need a proper sized a uh, window AC unit for your size room where it's never going to keep up kind of a situation. So there's a lot to it. Uh, cold rooms aren't always the cheapest to assemble, but if you're trying to do it proper and trying to go all out with it, a cold room is essential. So you could have like a 10 by 12 room in your garage. Uh, you get like maybe a 18 to 24,000 BTU uh, air conditioners that's compatible. And then you can order this cool bot that will trick it into making your room into a cold room, correct? Correct. They were originally done up for uh, dry aging beef and stuff. So people at home could just dry age beef. And then people in the cannabis community are like, oh, I'm, I could use that for making hatch. So it's gotten yeah. really good. And I feel like a lot of their sales these days are for people using it for hatch because it's only like a $350 unit. And it works great, and it's a uh, five-minute or less assembly to put it on there. It's super easy. Um, it's definitely a game-changer. Because before that, your ACs would not want to go to a certain temperature. You'd have to get a certain kind of thing to get the temps you wanted. And it just makes it a lot easier and cheaper for people to, to make hash, just like the freeze dryer makes the drying aspect a lot easier. Because air-dried is definitely – it's nice, but it's hard. <laughs> Yeah, especially in the summer in Florida. 
Yeah, especially a, a small home, and you're, you know, it's air drying's, you know, it just takes a lot of practice. Yeah, well, I mean, everywhere is getting hot these days. I mean, even you know, here on the West Coast, our summers have been getting really, really hot lately, and so. Uh, yeah, all really great advice. Well, um, we're coming up on the towards the end of our interview. Um, JR was going to give you a second uh, or a couple moments to see what kind of last couple questions we wanted to get in. I also was going to sh- give a shout out to everyone uh, watching us live in the cannabis community. Uh, we Mushmouth, we've been getting a lot of great feedback uh, from this interview so far. Um, Captain Chronic THC said, uh, what did he say? He said, this is a great interview, um, and he said that you, you're you dropping such great knowledge. So uh, shout out. And then also uh, White Sox said that you were inspiring him to uh, press the half pound of trim he has in his freezer. So, um, and oh yeah, Captain Chronic said that the, you uh, this guy has killer advice, is what you said. So thanks so much. Uh, this has been really fun. And uh, shout out to everyone like, once again in the cannabis community for your great questions in the chat. All right. One last question of questions. Uh, A lot of us hear about cold curing hash or rosin. Uh, Can you talk about cold curing versus uh, not cold curing? So yeah, cold curing is just referring to the post pressing process. So for us, we'll taffy pull our our rosin and then put it in a jar and store it in our fridge that sits about 45 degrees for about seven to 14 days. Some strains take longer than others. Some strains are faster. We wait for it to go fully white and the terpenes to separate and sit on top before we whip it all together. Um, some people get uh, or are calling what uh, they do cold cure when they're curing it at room temp or higher and whipping it and getting it done in a matter of a day or two. And that's not true cold cure. And I feel like it makes it not, kind of ruins the name of cold cure because there are you know, everyone can just say what it is instead of trying to pass it for something that it's not. But there's plenty of just different post-processing techniques like jam tech, which is actually where you let it sit on a hot plate from, you know, anywhere from 90 to 120 degrees for two to eight days, depending on what you're going for and what temp you're doing and what strain it is. Because every strain reacts differently. That's the biggest thing with Ross. It's all about temperatures and it's all about timing. So if, depending on what you're going for, you got to do different processes. Just like there's mechanical separation of your THCA, where which is where you press your rosin and then you put it back into a bag and repress it at a lower temp to where just your terpenes and you know your easier stuff to press is off. And then all that's left within your bag is your THCA essentially. And you after you get all your terps to press out, you raise up your temps, you press it again, and all your THCA will press it out into a nice clear shatter looking substance. And you can just roll that into rods, break it up into pieces and mix it with the, that terps that you pulled out. And it's essentially solventless diamonds and socks. But there's all kinds of just different post processings that you can do for different textures, different looks, different smells is all it's really about. How do they get it into a cart so that you can have a rosin cart? Uh, that's usually done in a small oven at anywhere from 150 to 180 ish degrees for a day to six days. It's a fully decar processing. So you're waiting for all your bubbles to go away. So you got to wait till it's fully decarb. But when rosin is fully decarb, it's just a runny sauce, which won't crash out and is smokable in a cart. You don't got to add anything else to it and it'll just smoke. That is incredible. And I'm sure there's like uh, probably prices on your head now for all of that insider secret information you just gave us all. <laughs> there, People just got to look for it. Nice. Well, we really appreciate, uh, you know, you sharing with us because a lot of people are new to this uh, rosin game. And uh, so the next thing we want to do is to wrap things up is to do some final shout outs. But before we do that, can you kind of give us a market report? Let us know. Uh, where rosin's at right now, what people are are looking for, and uh, what kind of price ranges you're in for a gram of really high quality rosin. Um, real high quality rosin goes from anywhere from like forty to eighty dollars a gram, depending on the brand and everything that goes into it. Um, and that's what it really comes down to is brands. Certain brands just get better prices, and certain people are just going to pay more for certain terps because they know that they don't yield the best, or only certain people have them. So that exclusivity thing drives the price up. 
You know what I mean? But uh, most rosin tends to be 40 to 50, sometimes 60 a gram for high quality rosin. It's not that much rosin that usually goes for 80 gram, at least here in Oregon. I know there's other states where it's definitely different, but as far as this state is, high quality rosin on the medical market ranges from about this price. Rosin on the rec market, quality rosin is usually, you know, depends on if you have a medical card. I've heard a lot of different prices uh, you know, from 50 to a hundred dollars a gram from some people, but I don't know. Honestly, I don't buy much rec rosin. Right. Right. And so what are kind of some of the trends of uh, flavors and stuff that people are looking for? Most people these days are looking for what's winning cups like Skittles and honey bananas and papayas and stuff like that. The fruit candy terps are real popular these days. Excellent. And so do you see that kind of, cause that's been an ongoing trend now, the candy and fruit over the last, I would say at least three or four to five years. I uh, think do you, see, do you see that? Uh, go ahead. I think since things went wreck, everyone's wanting more of a social kind of high. And those fruit candy terps tend to have an okay high, but not an overwhelming high. Something yeah. you can sit there and taste and have a good social time with compared to certain like gassy, funky strains are just too intense for some people. Where certain sativa right. are just too racy for some people. So that's why I feel like the market, the mass majority likes that certain terpene profile is the high that tends to come with it. Isn't something they're going to get blasted on. It's something that they can smoke all day long be social and feel good and just like the flavor. That's so it's like rosin, rosin light that tastes really good. Yeah, essentially. You know what I mean? But not, not everyone's smoking for medical benefits. Like me, I smoke for medical benefits. That's why I like the gas. I like something that has a punch to it. I like something that tastes care of what I'm needing. You know what I mean? Not everyone that smokes these days is necessarily looking for that. Yeah. 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 That's such an interesting point um, that I, it's, it almost makes me wonder if at some point you'll see people want to kind of somehow have the same strain and effects, but I guess dial down the THC a little bit or whatever it would be so that they don't get as stoned. Cause like you said, um, now that we're a little bit more recreational and you have, uh, I would assume a lot of people that are not buying as much, like they might buy an eighth for their entire week. Whereas me, I'm by like an ounce and that gets me through most of the week. If that, you know what I mean? Where I'm, I'm just going through way much more flour and my tolerance is way higher. So I really like those like super Sony stony strains where if you're more of a social or just like, I just hit a bowl like once and it knocks me out all night. Like I'm not going to want those super, super stony strains. And maybe that's why people went towards these desserts and, and things like that. Um, anyways, just rambling. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much for uh, the conversation. We had one last question from Captain Chronic THC. He asked, uh, do you grow looser um, uh, nugs or are you looking are you looking for strains that grow tighter nugs like could you talk a bit about that um like in terms of what tr usually translates towards hash typically i tend to like a little bit looser of a nug but i more so look for terps i have plenty of strains that are dense tighter nugs it just takes more work for me to break it down into smaller buds when i'm harvesting and more work when i'm mixing it some strains are just easier to work, I don't have to break the buds down as much, which I like. Like anything with Gorilla Glue in it falls apart. I don't have to chop my buds down as small to feel like it's going to wash good. Something that's dense like Cushman's, I got to chop those buds up to make sure I'm going to get my full extract. If I don't chop it up enough, I'm not going to be able to access the inside of the bud and get the trikes off the inside. Interesting. Very cool. Well, let's see where, what kind of events are coming up that, uh, that you're going to head out to, or maybe people could keep an eye out for you at. I know the hemp fest, uh, uh, the Saturn seed bank is going to be dropping a bunch of seeds there because they just started up there getting the website, uh, set up and ready. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to make it to that. Uh, I'm not sure what all events we're going to this summer. We're going to try to obviously make some, I think we're going to hit DFO, um, we're going to try to hit Ego Clash the uh, end of this year and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. We need to look up some more events. We've just been busy getting everything ready for the outdoors. So we've just been busy around the farm and stuff. Haven't really looked into too much. And and so you won this past year's Ego Clash, right? No, no, no. We got fifth or place. At fifth place. Fifth place. 
No, so what was that? What was that experience like competing in in Ego Clash and 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 I made even fifth place is pretty damn good. I mean, I mean, amongst that uh, standing of people, right? These are like some of the best of the best. Yeah, uh, Ego Clash and uh, Z Hill were invite only competitions of the best of the best and whatnot. Uh, it, it's cool as everyone who enters judges. So I got to sit there and smoke everyone's entry while everyone else is smoking everyone's entry. Yeah, so everyone yeah. sits yeah. and fill it out. Uh, they pass a jar down. It just goes in a circle. Um, everyone starts with one. Mm-hmm. It gets passed, and uh, it goes until we're done. Uh, Z Hill was only thirty entries, but uh, smoking thirty uh, rosins in you know a few hours definitely uh, fun stuff and gets you pretty high. And that was four twenty. Uh, Ego Clash was forty two entries, and we had to do that in five hours. So that was a fast pace uh, kind of just marathon to uh, get it all sampled and judged and all that kind of stuff but i like the way they do their judging everyone gets to judge and sit down and be there for it no one knows whose jar is what because there's no labels on the jar other than the number all that kind of stuff everyone brings it in the same jar it's funny watching certain cuts where everyone just brings whatever jar they want which just makes it obvious whose jar it is um but you know it's fun getting to go to these kind of things and stuff and uh, get the brand out there and the exposure yeah, for yeah, sure. we're doing the we're doing the Dude Grows Cup here on June third, and it, it's set up a very similar way. Uh, you put your entry in, and they put it in a jar, and then uh, you don't have any idea, you know, what who's got what or even what strain it is. And they give you a one e a lighter and a poker, and you go around and try as many of the strains as you want. There's fifty entries, and then at the end of the day, they uh, come up with a winner. So it's very similar to that. I like that style of judging. Um, although I want to ask you, after you're about 15 dabs in, uh, how do you? What does your judging criteria become at that point? Most things are more judged on look, appearance, uh, like how it smokes, kind of the situation. Obviously, one of the categories is the effects. But you're right. After so many dabs, it's hard to really judge what the effects are some strains are creeper you don't feel it for 20 minutes which is three dabs later you know what i mean kind of a situation uh so there definitely is that effect to it does make it a little hard to judge everything when you only have so much time to judge it all in one day um i feel like that does affect it a little bit but like i said for the most part of things more there's more categories that are based off of looks and flavor and uniqueness than there is just the high you know what i mean yeah, for us, it's about bag appeal, smell, and taste. Because yeah. after a while, the effect part of it, like you said, gets blurred. And so that's kind of the way that, you know, I think people mostly judge uh, those uh, types of situations. And once again, I feel that's why fruit's so popular right now in the cups is because what stands out the most, like fruit strains, just like they, they linger, they stick, compared to a lot of the other strains that don't stick but are more effective. Because, you know, what what's most seen and what's easier to appeal to, you know? For right. sure. Well, Mushmouth, it's been a great one hanging out with you. Um, where can people follow you or keep in touch? Or do you have a website? Like, what? where can people look you up? Yeah, I'm Mushmouth420 on Instagram. That's about all I have at the moment. Um, once I get more stuff, I will, you know, I'll be posting on Instagram anytime I do something. Nice. And what was the what was the name of the seed bank that's going to be dropping uh, the Legends of Mush? It's uh, Saturn Seed Bank. All right, Saturn Hell Seed yeah. Bank. We'll be looking for that. Yeah, shout out to Saturn Seed Bank. Well, um, Mushmouth, thank you so much for joining us today. We've had a great one. Thank you so much to everyone, all of our supporters. Once again, everyone in the live chat, they've been having a great time. Uh, Captain Chronic THC was enjoying the show. James Cannabis, um, all everyone in the chat. So thank you so much, everyone in there. Also, shout out to Grove Bags. If you want to grab yourself a Grove, ba- Grove Bag, please use the code Cannabis for 7% off your next order. And then, of course, shout out to Tiki Madman over at Tiki Seeds. <laughs> dot com and tiki madman dot com uh tiki seeds has got that 20 percent off sale and then um that's about it we're gonna be off next weekend because we're gonna be at the dude grows cup and then we'll have more interview interviews coming at you when when we get into june so uh put some plants outside just like 
uh, Mushmouth was talking about at the top of the show. Now's a good time to start putting some plants outside and uh, growing some weed outdoors. But thank you so much, Mushmouth. Had a really great time chatting with you today. Thanks awesome. a lot, buddy. We always appreciate it, man. We always appreciate it. All right, JR. As always, hope you all have a good one. And growers love. Growers love all. Peace.